hit the recording here and let me just introduce our speakers today. Um, I'm pleased to have uh, speaking for us, uh, Jim Ronka and Ryan Hurd, both from the uh, Annapol Weiss firm in Philadelphia and New Jersey. Uh, Jim is one of the top trial lawyers in Pennsylvania and has been for many years. I won't say many, many years because he might get upset with me making a crack at no, his age. <laughs> but Jim focuses practice uh, on helping uh, injury victims. And he literally wrote the book on uh, Pennsylvania insurance law. And it's the go-to book for any attorney that uh, practices in that area of law. If they're uh, practicing that area, they're, they're referring to Jim to assist them in, in uh, helping their clients. Um, our firms have had a long business relationship and uh, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is that uh, Jim and his partners are excellent uh, trial lawyers, excellent um, injury attorneys in the Philadelphia area. But also, um, I just, I trust Jim and I trust his team there. And that's really the number one uh, ch characteristic that we pick out whenever we're looking for uh, business partners to refer Legal Shield members to and our other clients. Ryan Hurd is also with us as well, and he's a partner at the uh, Annapol Schweitz firm, also focusing his practice on uh, injury law. Very active trial lawyer in uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and uh, has been named one of the top 100 trial lawyers um, in Pennsylvania. So we're really happy to have Ryan here as well. And he's uh, very actively involved in business interruption claims, which is really what the focus of this seminar is today. A lot of business owners or a lot of businesses uh, were significantly impacted as a result of the shutdown orders that happened in the um, early spring uh, that persisted throughout the summertime where they had to close their business or couldn't access um, places of business. And so uh, we've encouraged business owners to consider filing business interruption claims to try to fill that gap in revenue that they, uh, that they suffered. And uh, there's, a, there's a real fight going on in the courts in Pennsylvania right now. And uh, Jim and Ryan are on the forefront of that. And we wanted to give them an opportunity to share um, what the potential um, opportunities are for business owners to file claims and to recover some of those losses that they've, that they've sustained. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Jim and Ryan, and I'm going to, let's see, I've got a couple more people to admit here. And I'm going to see if I can <clears throat> share the screen with you. You might have to ask for permission to share the screen, Jim, and if you do, I'll go ahead and hand that over to you. See if that's an option that's yeah. available to you. I got two computers here, so I got the wrong, uh, wrong mouse there. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, oh, there I am. Okay. Got it. You should yeah. be able to sh share your screen. Okay. Let me find what I'm looking for here. Go back to the top. Make this big. There we go. All right. Can everybody see that? How are we doing with that? Very good. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being on today. So um, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a tremendous impact on many businesses in Pennsylvania. Um, because of the forced closures, the required social distancing, um, the uh, inability to run the businesses the way uh, we have traditionally because of the risk of transmission. This has been a problem, obviously, across the country. Um, Businesses normally have a, some type of business insurance. Uh, they vary quite a bit, but they have certain things in common. Most of these policies are called all risk policies. And what that means is that it covers all risks unless the risks are specifically excluded. Um, most of you probably don't know that that's the type of coverage that you have. In fact, most business owners aren't 100% sure what their coverage is. Um, just like most people don't really know exactly what their auto insurance coverage provides, except they might know that they have a certain amount of property damage coverage or liability coverage, or they might know what their deductible is. But the, the intricacies inside the policy are usually not known either to business people or to regular automobile insurance, using that as an analogy. 
And so what we have seen uh, over time is the, uh, um, I'm gonna put this up to the top, oh, not working. Okay, so what we have seen over time uh, uh, is that uh, since this pandemic began and since the closures began because of varying government orders, and they also vary state by state and location by location, Philadelphia being different than Pittsburgh, being different than Cincinnati, being different than someplace in Texas, for example. And, and you, you're all aware of the differences. But uh, there, there was interruption of business, and most business owners believe that they have what was known as business interruption insurance, meaning that if for some reason their business was shut down, they lost money during that period because they had no revenue, they could make a claim against their insurance carrier for a period of time up to the limits of the policy. The claims related to this pandemic have almost universally been declined by the insurance carriers. In other words, nobody's paying. And this has led to a whole number of lawsuits by, on behalf of businesses against their insurers to get the payment for this coverage. Um, typically, you will get a denial letter explaining the reasons why you don't have coverage under your policy. This will lay out uh, what the terms of the policy are. And if you just read that letter, you would say to yourself, I don't have coverage. But the fact is that insurance law and the way insurance policies are interpreted is much more complicated than that. And in fact, we believe that there is coverage under many of these policies and that our clients can recover. And we probably represent about 200 different businesses um, around not only Pennsylvania, but uh, New Jersey, Ohio, and a bunch of other states. Uh, and we're heavily involved in this litigation, and Ryan's been one of the leaders uh, in that litigation. So let's just go through the law very briefly. We're not going to go too deep into the weeds so that you understand what your policies really are and how they should be interpreted. So let's first start with the law uh, as opposed to the policy themselves. So the basic legal principle is that when you get your insurance policy, other than um, negotiating the amounts of coverage, you don't really have any bargaining power with the insurance company to say, okay, well, I would like this clause change or that clause change, or I don't like the language of this part of your insurance contract. Therefore, um, uh, I would like to change that. You can't do that. You either accept the policy as it comes with the coverages that you've agreed to, or you don't get coverage with that company. And that's just the way it is. It's the way it's always been. So what the courts say about that is this, because the insurer, the insurance company has greater bargaining power and expertise, the law requires the insurer to act in good faith with respect to its insurers. In other words, it can't be all about just its own personal profit, profit motive. It has to act within good faith to the insured. And that involves a number of things, not the least of which is clearly telling the insured what's in the policy. In other words, what are you buying when you pay your insurance policy premium, okay? Now, and that involves, since insurance policies are lengthy, business policies, we've seen them anywhere from 70 to 200 pages, 250 pages, and they can be very dense and complex because they have a clause here and then 20 page, it relates to a clause that's 20 pages later, which might relate to another clause that's 20 pages later. And literally, if you wanna understand the policies, you have to take you know, this piece and, and make, almost make, make a spreadsheet and line it up with other pieces so you can figure out exactly what you have, all right? I, I've told this story a hundred times, but I was in front of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court on an insurance issue and I asked the court how many of them had read their policy. And the answer was none, okay? So there we are in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. They're about to do a, do a case interpreting a policy. They never read their own policy. So um, I got a little guff back for asking the court that, but that's the way it goes. So um, uh, insurance contracts, then, when you take the language, they're interpreted not by the language that the insurer wants to have it interpreted by, but by applying common definitions for words and phrases in the policy. In other words, the kind of definitions we would use in everyday language, unless, unless there's a specific definition in the policy 
So they would usually have words in bold or words in quotation marks. And if that's the case in the policy, then those words have a specific meaning. But lots of words in the policy are only supposed to be with their common definition. The second big rule is whenever a term or phrase in the policy is ambiguous, in other words, subject to more than one reasonable interpretation, then the interpretation the court will accept is the interpretation most favorable to coverage or most favorable to the insured who bought the policy. And it doesn't matter. It's not like it's a test of which interpretation is more reasonable. Any interpretation that's reasonable that favors the insured is the interpretation that the court will use. So you can see, because the insurance companies write the policies, when it comes to interpreting the policies, the deck is somewhat stacked against the insurers and in favor of you guys. Okay. Also, case law requires an insurance contract to read to meet the reasonable expectations of the insured. And what were you told that you were getting? What did they advertise that you were getting? What were your expectations? If you purchased business interruption coverage, did you believe that you were going to get coverage if your business was interrupted and not subject to a whole laundry list of exclusions? And let me assure you that the, the list of exclusions is lengthy, okay? One we're gonna look at is subparagraph J of B. So, I mean, and they go almost through the whole alphabet. So uh, there are a lot of exclusions of coverage. So what did you expect to get? That's part of the proof. Now, if it's clear that the policy doesn't cover something, um, I think acts of terrorism are excluded. And that's, they make that crystal. And everybody kind of knows what an act of terrorism is. So uh, that's excluded. But when it's not clear, then it depends on how the courts interpret the policy and you have some advantages there. All right, now let's turn to the coverage we're talking about. So we're calling it business interruption coverage, but that's not what it's called in the policies. I've not seen that phrase, right, Ryan? Correct. Okay, so it, it, it's actually uh, coverage for business income loss, okay? Uh, or what's called civil authority coverage. We'll get into that in a second. So, so what is business income loss? All right. So let's say you had a fire and you you had you have a um, a restaurant. You have a fire. You can't open your restaurant because of the fire, and your business is quote uh, interrupted, and you suffer business loss uh, during a period of restoration when they are fixing it up so you can reopen. Okay, that's covered. All right. Um, What's not clear is whether a virus being in your property would be the type of damage or loss that would cause you to be able to recover your business income, okay? So let's look at a couple of the different policies, all right? So a common policy that we see in, in Pennsylvania is Erie Insurance. Uh, it's, it's a domestic, meaning it's from Pennsylvania. Uh, another policy, uh, that we often see is Liberty Mutual, but Liberty Mutual, you see that little uh, ISO there, ISO next to Liberty Mutual? Liberty Mutual, there's a, there's a group called the Insurance Services Office or ISO that makes up insurance policies and gets them approved in states. And then a company, instead of having their own policies approved, will just adopt the ISO. So many companies will have the, one, have the clause on the right and only insurance, only Erie insurance will have the clause on the left. So this is how the policies differ sometimes, all right? Now, um, Erie insurance calls it income protection coverage, a little bit different. And it means loss of income or rental income you sustain during a partial or total interruption of business resulting, now this is the important part of it, directly from loss or damage to property. And that's your property because it's the premises described. So one of the main ways the companies are denying coverage is by saying there's no direct loss or damage to your property. And they're defining loss or damage as like structural loss, like a fire would cause. Uh, they're not saying that a virus on the surfaces of, if you have a restaurant, your counters or your tables, or if you have a dental office, for example, your, your equipment or your chairs or whatever, 
Um, they're not, they're not saying, they say that's not a physical loss or damage, all right? We'll get into that in a minute, okay? Uh, the Liberty Mutual policy or ISO policy is a little bit different, okay? They call it, instead of directly from, direct physical loss of or damage to property, all right? Now, when we're looking at this, you'll see the word or is in bold. All right, why is that important? It's important because you've got a word loss. Remember, look on the left, underlined loss. It's in quotes, okay? Meaning that inside the policy in another place, there's a definition of that word and that's the definition that rules, okay? But they don't limit it to loss. They say loss or damage. But what does that mean when you're interpreting a policy? It means that damage has to be something different than loss. It can't be the same thing. So, and, and when you look at the definition of loss, it includes the word damage. So the word damage after the word or has to mean something else or don't include it. That's the rule. So we're taking the position that that damage is a broader term. It means harm. It means loss, uh, uh, um, it, it could mean loss of use. It could be rendering a property uninhabitable. And there's a number of cases that have occurred in the past that, for example, for asbestos fibers or for uh, a bad smell or for bacteria, which allowed the coverage because of this ore situation that we're looking at there. Okay? And we won't go any farther than that because we can, I could uh, bore you to death. All right. Now, so what is business income for purpose of the policy? So there's a definition of that. And in the ISO policy, so that's a lot of companies, I would say most companies, business income means net income that you would have earned, but it also means continuing normal operating expenses incurred. So it's two parts. One is, your net income, meaning your total revenue less your expenses, that's the net income, you lost that. But you also have expenses. So if you have a restaurant, maybe you have rent. Uh, maybe you paid your employees part way through. Maybe you furloughed them and paid for their health insurance. Maybe you have uh, continuing uh, uh, debt payments. Whatever your income, I mean, your expense side of your balance, not your balance sheet, your, your income and loss statement is, that is covered as part of business income. So really, that's not income, that's expenses. Uh, but it's going to come up later, as you'll see, uh, and end up being very helpful that the definition is two parts. It's both the loss of income and reimbursement of your expenses. Okay, next. All right, now the other one we talked about was the actions of a civil authority, any government, federal government, state government, county, city, whatever. If uh, there is damage to property, not your property, some other property nearby, and a civil authority says, in order to protect the health and welfare of the community, we need to prohibit access to your property. You could have a business income loss claim. Note, no damage to your property, just prohibition of access. And so what are a number of important words in this part of the policy? Well, first off, it just says damage to the other property. It doesn't use that word loss, if you recall. So damage we interpreted was the broader category. Loss was a limited category. If they wanted it to be limited, they'd have used loss in quotation marks where it says damage instead of using the word damage, all right? Secondly, it says prohibits access. And you'll see in the denial letters from the company if you make the claim that they're gonna say that, well, you had access to your property, you could go to your property, just your customers couldn't go, okay? Uh, so, but we think that the word access, if you use a common definition, uh, especially related to a business, is that if your customers can't come in, then access is prohibited. And uh, that's what it's about. It's a business income loss. They're not prohibiting people from going in your house. 
So um, there's, a, again, we talked about the importance of interpretation of these contracts, and that's where it plays in, all right? Now, um, some of the policy a little different. So Erie says access to the area immediately around the damaged property, okay? So, uh, and as a result of damage. So we get back to that question, does the virus cause damage? And that's an issue, all right? Next, uh, what is a, a civil authority? It's an action taken in response to a dangerous physical condition resulting from damage or continuation of some peril. Uh, so it, it's like the orders that you've seen from Governor Wolf in Pennsylvania, from Governor DeWine in, our, in, in Ohio, uh, uh, and, and, and all different states around the country at different points in time, okay? At different points in time and how they affect your particular business. For example, in Pennsylvania, on March 6th, uh, there was an emergency disaster order. March 19th, closed uh, all nine life-sustaining businesses, closed. All physical locations until further notice, all right? Stay-at-home order, March 23rd, extended April 1st, okay? So your customers can't get to you if you're a clothing store. Uh, you're, you're closed down. You have no income stream, but your expenses continue. Our argument is this is the type of civil authority order that you bought insurance coverage to protect your business against, okay? Now, these policies, as I said, if they're all risk policy, they say, okay, everything's covered, unless it's excluded, and then they have a lengthy list of exclusions, and one of the exclusions is a virus exclusion, all right? so. It says, we won't pay for loss or damage caused directly or indirectly by any of the following. And then you go down to J, virus or bacterium. Any virus that induces or is capable of inducing physical distress, illness, or disease. So once again, it sounds like you guys are out of luck. No claim. Okay. All right. Two things. First, these virus clauses were inserted in the policies beginning in around 2006. A lot of the policies didn't see these virus exclusions till around 2011. Many people have insurance with the same company for lengthy periods of time. And so the exclusion was added. Now there's a principle of law that says, if the exclusion changes coverage, in other words, lessens your coverage, you should get a premium reduction. Uh -huh. But if the exclusion is just clarifying, then you don't get a premium reduction. And what we're saying is a lot of these clauses said bacterium before, but didn't say virus. By adding virus during an epidemic of swine flu that happened at the time, then it is actually a reduction in coverage and they should have given you a premium reduction, which they didn't. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. Let's put that on the shelf. Let's look at the other thing. Look, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor there, pretty faint, but it says we will not pay for loss or damage, all right? All right, and, 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 and then when you go back to the definition of business income, they talk about loss of income but there's a separate category expenses. And if you look throughout most policies, the, word, the, the, the losses for expenses are treated differently in all different types of coverages from loss of income or damage to property. So the position that we've taken with the courts in the cases that we have is that the expenses, this, even if this exclusion applies, it doesn't apply to expenses. It only applies to loss or damage. Loss of income or damage to the property. It doesn't apply to your continuing expenses like rent, salaries, whatever, okay? And that's part of the business income loss and we say that's recoverable. So these are the ways that we are uh, uh, fighting back to get coverage for our businesses that, that we're working on behalf of over time. Now, virus exclusion. 
So the one we just looked at is, is called the ISO virus exclusion, all right? And that's the one that we think this argument works. There's another one out there. We'll just call it for now the much tougher virus exclusion. Um, and uh, it would be much harder uh, because it's way more detailed and clear. So that, that's a much harder case, and we're not sure we can win any of those cases. But not that many policies have this one. In addition, you should know that some companies like Erie Insurance and Cincinnati Insurance, Philadelphia Indemnity, and I think Donegal, Ryan, yeah. don't have virus exclusions at all. So if you have an Erie Insurance policy, you're in much better shape than most businesses in making these claims. Okay. Um, so Ryan's been working with the clients uh, uh, more directly than I am. I'm sort of uh, supervising the litigation and, and doing some of the legal part. So I'm going to ask Ryan, who's been on the front lines here, to uh, go over the next few slides, which include the, what type of information we need to make a claim, and secondarily, what's been happening out in the courts in real time over the past couple months with these exact cases. Okay, good morning. So when we meet with you by phone, what we want you to have ready is a copy of your policy, if, if you have it. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, we at least need to know who your insurance carrier is because we can reach out to them and get it from them. Uh, if you got your policy by using an agent or a broker, we like that information as well. Uh, sometimes we'll reach out to the agent or broker to get information. And there's always a, a question about, is there a claim against the broker for giving you insurance, which was less than what you were looking for? Uh, they could have some liability there. We also ask that you have a copy of your denial. If you have already submitted a claim, if you haven't, that's okay. We can walk you through the claim submission and, and help you get that denial. Uh, and we can guarantee you're going to be denied because we've never seen one case out of hundreds. Um, where the insurance carrier said, sure, we're gonna pay you. Uh, the third big thing we need is a profit loss statement, some type of financial, so we can quantify what your losses are. The, the losses have to be something that we can calculate and that we can prove. Um, we will not ask you to read your insurance policy and, and interpret it. We'll take care of that for you. Uh, it's just a matter of us getting that information from you. And we need to get it in a timely fashion. Ideally, from the time that we speak, we want to have everything we can get from you within two weeks because there are statutes of limitations that apply to these policies. Uh, not just out there in the law, but your policy will have a section that says action against us or legal action against us. And it requires that you comply with all the terms of the policy, including suing the insurance company within the requisite period which is generally one or two years. So it's important that you know once we speak, we do move quickly um, because time is important and you can run out and we don't want that to happen. If you don't file something before the expiration of that statute of limitations, you would be forever barred from recovering. Ryan, can I jump in a second? Uh, on the agent, so to a certain extent, you rely on your agent to sell you coverage. Um, and if there are coverages out there with a virus exclusion and without a virus exclusion, for example, if they sold you one with a virus exclusion, maybe that's something that you should have known before you bought the policy. Because an agent can have neg negligence or agent malpractice just like a lawyer could, all right, or a doctor. Now, some people have long, long relationships with their agents and don't want to sue them. We understand that. We're, we, have, we have to tell you all the possibilities. Go ahead, Ryan. So another good example of that situation with a broker where a broker fails you is we have a client right now who had a policy, a Cincinnati policy that did not have a virus exclusion. And it was time for him to re-up and the broker said, oh, I got a better policy for you. It's, it's better coverage, it's less money. And a client says, sure, great. He gets the coverage. Well, guess what? It has a virus exclusion in there now. So his case is that much stronger against the insurance company because he's got this virus exclusion that the broker sold him without making it clear to him that you're actually going to have a, a greater exclusion now. So that's a case that we like against the broker. So in, in handling these cases, the way we start is by a complaint. And what the complaint does is it sets out all of our allegations against the insurance company and all of the reasons why we think coverage should apply. Um, this is how it starts in, in cases across the country. 
one of the first actions that the insurance company takes in defense is to file a motion to dismiss the case. Before they ever answer or do anything, they file a motion to dismiss. And they tell the court, look, this case cannot prevail on the face of the complaint. Just looking at the complaint itself, there is no possible uh, way that this, this case can prevail. Um, so these motions to dismiss are being filed all over the country and being decided all over the country right now. Um, so far, there are, there's 10 listed here, there's 13 or 14 cases where the motion to dismiss has been granted. That means that the plaintiff, the, the insured business, is out of court, they have lost. And the reasons that we're seeing for the courts granting the motions to dismiss are really on two grounds. The court will either say, the easy one is the cop out, which is there's a virus exclusion, you lose because your losses here were caused by the COVID virus, that's excluded under your policy, under no set of circumstances could you prevail. So that's the one easy cop out for the court. The second is the court will say that there is no direct physical loss or damage to trigger the business interruption coverage or the civil authority coverage. And what we're seeing in that category is two subcategories to it. The first is that the law of whatever court is hearing the case requires that for there to be direct damage, there has to be a physical alteration, a material physical alteration to a property. So for the court to agree that you have damage that will trigger coverage, you'd have to show that there's this material alteration to the property. And the courts are saying COVID is not, not a qualifying event. A fire would be, a flood would be, but not COVID. COVID is something that you just wipe up. In the cases where the um, courts see that the definition of uh, physical damage is a little bit broader, for instance, uh, maybe asbestos or the threat of imminent asbestos contamination, the courts have still granted motions to dismiss, and the reason has been a deficiency in the complaint that starts the case in the beginning. So the courts are deciding or making their decisions based on what the complaint says. And these complaints that are getting dismissed in this other category, the reason is that the attorneys never pled this direct physical damage. They didn't plead that COVID caused direct physical damage to their client's property. They're pleading that due to the civil authority orders, they had to shut down. The problem is in the policy, direct physical loss or damage to the property is the trigger. So you have to plead that. Because it's not pled in the complaint, the courts can just outright dismiss those, those uh, complaints. It's not all bad news, however. Uh, a handful of cases have survived the motion to dismiss stage. And what we're seeing in these cases is like the complaints that we're filing, uh, they're very detailed in their allegations. They make it clear that COVID caused physical damage to the insured's property and COVID caused physical damage to property in the vicinity of the insured property, which triggered civil authorities to take action vis-a-vis uh, -vis shutting down the property and prohibiting access. So it's very important that that is pled. And in these cases, which have prevailed on a motion to dismiss, those allegations have been su sufficient. Uh, there has even been motions to dismiss that were denied where there was a virus exclusion. Um, specifically in Florida, which is interesting because another Florida judge uh, granted the motion to dismiss, but in this Florida case that's listed here, the court found that the virus exclusion did not um, unambiguously exclude the losses. They did not find it convincing that the virus exclusion was clear enough. So they are allowing that case to proceed forward. Now in each of these cases where the motions to dismiss are, are denied, the courts are, are limiting the progression of the case a little bit and they're bifurcating. And what that means is they're allowing the cases to proceed to discovery, that's the exchange of information, for purposes of liability, for purposes of interpreting the insurance contract. They're separating the part of discovery that will be geared towards uh, determining the damages. But nonetheless, in these cases, um, a win is a really positive thing and it creates leverage and, and some risk against the insurance company that could motivate them to settle a case. Ryan, could I jump in a second? Please. All right. 
So in these cases where the, the business is lost and the insurance company won, Brian actually went out and got the complaints in every one of these cases and some additional ones. And what he found was that the pleading, the complaint, this is the document you used to file suit, was just not sufficiently detailed. And that it has been our goal from the get-go to file very, very, very detailed complaints that would cover the deficiencies that we've seen in these cases. And we think that most of the cases on this page where the plaintiffs, the, the businesses won, was because their complaints were more detailed than they were uh, uh, in the other case. So we're, we're in the detailed category of complaints. And we're even evolving our detail. So we've had motions to dismiss that we've had to fight against, which haven't been decided against or decided. And just the other day, I got a motion to dismiss in one of these cases. And one of our options is sometimes we can amend our complaint to add more information. So when I see a motion to dismiss, I read it. And generally, I find that our complaint has already covered all of the grounds. And my next step is then to just write an opposition detailing why they're, why they're wrong. But in some instances, a motion to dismiss might have a argument that says, well, this complaint doesn't say such and such with enough specificity, for instance. And it might provide an, an argument about what should have been said. So in those cases, I'm amending the complaint and I'm taking the insurance company's own language, their own argument, and I'm inserting it as an allegation to our complaint. So they can no longer say that I should have said something that I didn't. And we're gonna to continue to evolve as these cases come through. Okay. But I'm, I'm pretty proud of our complaint. It's very detailed um, and, and I'm pretty confident in it. Um, just briefly on contamination clauses. Ryan? Um, I actually, I haven't had to deal with the contamination clauses a whole lot. There has been one case where, and this is really interesting. Um, it's a school which had a contamination clause or a, um, infectious disease clause that basically says if your property is contaminated by a virus um, or in, works in a restaurant as well, if your property is contaminated by a virus and you are shut down by some civil authority or department of health, we will provide you with coverage. And um, I'm, I'm happy when I see these, these clauses in the policy, but I haven't seen a lot. But in this one case, the school had a student or a parent who came in and found out that they were contaminated with COVID and the school immediately shut down and reached out to the Department of Health. Well, in the meantime, the state shut down everyone. So the Department of Health didn't issue a specific letter to the school, but the state shut down everybody. So our client made a claim for this contamination coverage and the insurance company still denied the claim. And they said, well, technically you had to be shut down by the Department of Health specifically related to your contamination. And the fact that everyone was shut down doesn't satisfy this insurance coverage. Um, so we're actually well pleased to be fighting this because I think it's a strong case against the, um, the insurance company. They should be providing coverage here. Uh, and in this case, we're actually alleging that they're acting in bad faith. We're not just asking for coverage, we're asking for trouble damages, punitive damages. Um, and there are food contamination clauses also, but it's just to point out that you have to look for everything in the policy and not just uh, you know the four or five specific things we referred to before, but there are a lot of uh, uh, intertwining uh, uh, paragraphs in the policy that you have to be careful about, okay? Um, we, I, and I think we already probably covered this, uh, liability agent or broker, insurance agent or broker has a duty not to misrepresent the coverage and has a duty to uh, fulfill the uh, insured's reasonable expectations. So there's a potential claim for the coverage against the broker on almost what amounts to a broker malpractice uh, issue. Again, we can't, we don't force anybody to try to sue their broker, uh, but, it's something that that is a possibility. So I think that really covers it probably in enough detail for, for today. You probably don't want, uh, you know, 11 hour legal lectures on all the rest of it. Uh, or we, you know, our briefs in these cases have been 30 or 40 pages. Uh, I find it amusing that the insurer files a, a short brief, maybe 20 pages, and then we file our response and they literally freak out and they've, they file a reply brief 
In other words, they've already filed a brief, but now they file another brief to try to cover all the things that we brought up that they they didn't cover. Um, and I, I always think that's sort of a, a, a cry for help. And, you know, it's like, oh my God, I never thought they were going to say anything like this. So we're hopeful. We think we have a couple of very good judges for our cases and we're hopeful of winning these uh, frontline battles and uh, moving forward on behalf of our clients. So we'll take any questions. Mike, if you have any comments, Ryan, if, I, if I've left anything out, you can correct me. I have, uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, what are the types of businesses that really lend themselves to these types of claims? Uh, I would imagine restaurants, salons, retailers of any kind that really require, that um, rely a lot on foot traffic. What, um, what types of businesses should really be looking into this? So you, you really nailed it with the restaurants and salons, um, retailers. Any business that was shut down is a stronger case. There are businesses that were not shut down. We have uh, a few clients who are doctors, pediatric offices and things of that nature that were deemed essential, but there was still orders that were issued that limited what they were allowed to do in the office. Uh, for instance, for a dentist, a cosmetic dentist, they're told, well, you can stay open, but you can only do emergency procedures. Well, cosmetic dentists aren't really doing emergency uh, procedures. Your, your crown falling off, you know, your veneer falling off isn't necessarily emergency. So they shut down. So there's still decent cases as well. Um, there are harder ones, for instance, like a uh, automotive uh, store retailer, like a Pep Boys. In, in some places, they were deemed essential because people need to be able to fix their cars and they stayed in business and their losses tend to be um, less drastic than the salon that was 100% shut down. Those kind of places where they were deemed essential, they're, they're much harder, but we're still examining those as well. Yeah, I mean, catering businesses got, got, got destroyed, concerts, um, uh, venues. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we have a whole number of really unusual businesses like, we could go into our place of business, but we could not go to where our, our customers were. Or yeah. we couldn't pick up our supplies because they were closed. So now we don't have anything. So now we're, a, we're open, but we don't have anything to sell or we can't give our services because the place was where we go are blocked. Some policies have coverage for that. Some, you know, they literally, um, and the, term, the term's escaping me at the moment, but. Dependent um, property coverage. Yeah, dependent property coverage. You're dependent on this other property and that's closed. But it's not in every policy. Yeah, that was, uh, you anticipated my next question because I've got, so, so the contracting trades, you know, roofing, roofing companies that might have been shut down or slowed down uh, because they couldn't go into other people's houses or. You know, are they are they uh, able to make some claims there? So you're saying if they have this dependent property coverage, they might they might have some claims. They sure. may have, right? Yeah. And in Philadelphia specifically, contractors were actually shut down for some period of time. Um, so yeah, I mean, different. There were different rules in different places. I I think in you know I practiced many years in Central PA, and there's a lot of small communities there that really didn't have much closed up restaurants. Yeah, Pittsburgh, Allegheny County here was pretty restrictive as well. And they, they shut down all construction sites for some period of time, which really uh, was, it was difficult for, for those places Day, to get uh, daycare. The yeah, daycares. Mm -hmm. Gotten a lot of um, clients called in with daycares. There's been a lot of interest on behalf of daycares. Other questions? Other questions from anybody? Many of the policies would you just say on average actually include the dependent property coverage? Um, I would say about half the policies I've seen have the dependent property coverage. Um, but what's been disappointing is dependent property coverage tends to have a much lower limit. So for business income generally, it will say 12, min 12 months of actual business income or even 18 months. But the dependent property is typically limited to ten thousand dollars. I've seen fifty thousand a few times, um, and I've seen one hundred thousand only once, and that was that the, the uh, insured specifically asked for it. But more often than not, it's a it's like a throw-in for for ten grand. I think a few of them had it in days too, but it was a short period. Yeah, I have seen that as well. Yeah, like thirty days or something, you know. But that's it. 
Other questions? Well, Jim and Ryan, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk about these these uh, topics. I, I've seen uh, Ryan's pleadings. They are quite detailed. It's very impressive, the work that they're doing. And really out there fighting for small business owners in Pennsylvania who really have taken the brunt of the, uh, of the damage as a result of this COVID pandemic. So it's a great thing that they're doing for our community um, out there and really just trying to get uh, benefits that uh, these folks have paid for anyway under their policies. So I, it's not surprising to me that the insurance industry is fighting this. I'm sure they look at it as a bloodbath from a financial perspective, but um, you know, somebody has got to fight on behalf of small business owners and, and get them the relief that they're, they, they really need out there. So we appreciate you guys putting this on for us today uh, very much. And it was all um, re really good. We really appreciate it. Thank you all and everybody stay safe. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.